The New Testament contains four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are generally recognized to exhibit much more similarity to one another than John, and they are referred to as the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels are so similar in some places that most scholars believe that some degree of literary dependence exists among them. Determining which gospel was written first, and to what extent the other synoptics depended upon it or upon each other, is the goal of scholars who specialize in what is known as the synoptic problem. As Mark Goodacre puts it, the synoptic problem might be defined as the study of the similarities and differences of the synoptic gospels in an attempt to explain their literary relationship. Calling it a problem is, of course, a bit misleading, as it suggests that there is some flaw or fault in the Synoptic Gospels. Stanley Porter and Brian Dyer point out, The word problem implies that there is something potentially wrong with how the Synoptic Gospels relate to one another. Instead of an appreciation for the similarities that one finds between the Synoptics, this term automatically labels their relationship a dilemma and therefore in need of fixing. It may be more helpful, therefore, to think of it as the synoptic puzzle rather than the synoptic problem. For over a century now, the prevailing scholarly opinion has favored Mark in priority, the idea that the Gospel of Mark was written first and that the Gospels of Matthew and Luke depended upon Mark. If correct, this hypothesis requires us to believe that virtually every early Christian writer who spoke on the subject was wrong about the order of the Gospels, and this, in turn, cast doubt upon the reliability of their witness to the traditional authorship of the Gospels. In other words, because the same sources which tell us that Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote these documents also tell us that Mark was not the first Gospel written, if they are wrong about the order, then there is some reason to think that they are wrong about the authorship as well. Goodacre expresses the general sentiment which most synoptic scholars have towards the early church on this matter when he says, The patristic evidence, therefore, is not marked enough to encourage us to disregard the overwhelming internal evidence for Mark and priority. It will be most prudent to continue to treat the patristic witness with a pinch of salt. But how strong is the evidence for Mark and priority? Is it really so overwhelming? Or are there compelling reasons to believe that Matthew is actually written first, and that scholars have been too quick to dismiss the unanimous testimony of the early church on this point? As we shall see throughout this series, the evidence for Mark and priority has been vastly overstated, and the evidence instead supports the idea that Mark was written last. But developing this case will take some time. In this video, I will only introduce the key terms and hypotheses, leaving assessments and critiques for future videos. This is an introduction to the synoptic problem. Studies in the synoptic problem are entirely motivated by the conviction that literary dependence exists between the synoptic gospels. But there are some scholars, such as David Farnell, who would deny this conviction. Farnell believes that the synoptic gospels are completely independent of one another, arguing that, in contrast to historical critical ideology, the independence view maintains that each gospel writer worked independently of the other three, each having no need to derive information from the other three. If Farnell is right, there is no synoptic problem, and consequently no need for any research into it. There is, however, a very serious objection to Farnell's hypothesis, namely that there are areas of verbatim agreement among the synoptics. For example, consider a parallel story in Matthew 21, 23-27, Mark 11, 27-33, and Luke 20, 1-8. You'll notice that these passages exhibit word-for-word -word correspondence in a great many places. This might seem easily explained by all three Gospels simply reflecting what Jesus and his critics really said. But remember that Jesus probably originally spoke in Aramaic, and that the Gospels are translating his words into Greek. It is highly unlikely that three authors, working independently of each other, would make the exact same translation choices this often. Furthermore, the Gospels were written several years after Jesus' ministry. It is implausible to suppose that all three Gospel writers would remember Jesus' words verbatim or get their information from those who did all those years later. This makes it doubtful that the Gospel authors even had Jesus' exact words from which to translate in the first place. This casts doubt on the complete independence view and makes it reasonable to consider that there is literary dependence at play. In reply to this sort of argument, Farnell resorts to appealing to the divine inspiration of Scripture. He argues that God revealed Jesus' exact words to the Gospel authors, as well as, apparently, the way in which he wanted them to be translated into Greek. 
He says, Although the Bible was written by men, God's superintendence of those men in the inscription of his word supernaturally overshadowed the product so that the Holy Spirit guaranteed the accuracy of what the men recorded. Such precision and composition is without parallel in human historiography. While Farnell's evident respect for the divine inspiration of scripture is admirable, there are three serious problems with his response. In the first place, from the perspective of the historical apologist, it is question-begging. Historical apologetics seeks to argue that the Gospels are historically reliable, and that on this basis we can believe in Jesus' miracles, and that for this reason we can believe the words of Jesus, and that it is because of this that we can believe that the Bible is divinely inspired. There is a logical order here, and addressing the synoptic problem is part of defending the first plank in the argument. Until this has been done, from the perspective of the historical apologist, there are no grounds for assuming the inspiration of Scripture. Farnell thus risks justifying his position in a circular fashion. In the second place, if Farnell wants to invoke divine verbal inspiration of Jesus' exact words to explain verbatim agreement within the synoptics, it becomes unclear how he can explain the differences. For although there are striking examples of word-for-word agreement in the synoptics, there are likewise striking examples of parallel passages where Jesus says essentially the same thing, but in very different words. Is Farnell going to say that God did not choose to inspire the exact words of Jesus in these instances? And if so, why is God so selective about when he is going to inspire Jesus' exact words and when he is not? Farnell owes us an explanation for this. The final problem is that verbatim agreement is not limited to the words of the people within the synoptic narratives. It also appears in the narrator's comments. For example, consider Matthew 24, 16 and Mark 13, 14, where the narrator specifically addresses the reader in the exact same words. This casts doubt on the idea that Farnell's theory, if it explains anything at all, can explain all of the relevant verbatim agreements within the Synoptic Gospels. The conclusion, then, is that the complete independence hypothesis is false. There is literary dependence among the Synoptic Gospels. But what is the order of the dependence? Which gospel was first, and which gospel was last? Several hypotheses have been put forward on that front, and I shall briefly introduce them now. For the past 100 years or so, the dominant proposal regarding the synoptic problem has been the two-source hypothesis. This hypothesis proposes that the Gospel of Mark was written first, and that Matthew and Luke both drew information from it, thereby explaining the material common to all three synoptic gospels. It additionally posits the existence of a document which we do not possess called Q, and says that Matthew and Luke also used Q as a source. This is supposed to explain the material common to both Matthew and Luke, but absent from Mark. Thus, because it posits that Matthew and Luke worked independently of one another, depending upon two different sources, it is called the two-source hypothesis. Until fairly recently, this hypothesis was thought to be the assured result of biblical scholarship. As Arthur Bellanzoni says, Whether justifiably or not, one of the most widely accepted conclusions of 20th century New Testament scholarship has been a simple literary solution, namely the hypothesis that Mark was the earliest written gospel, that the authors of Matthew and Luke in writing their gospels used Mark in a second source, commonly designated Q, and perhaps one or more additional sources. But for good reason, the two-source hypothesis has waned in popularity among scholars, despite still being the most widely held. The most popular alternative is the so-called Ferrer hypothesis, spearheaded by Austin Ferrer in the mid-20th century and in modern times by Mark Goodacre. This hypothesis agrees with the two-source hypothesis on the priority of Mark, as well as Matthew and Luke's use of Mark, but it dispenses with the hypothetical Q document. Instead, it explains the material common to Matthew and Luke by recourse to Luke utilizing Matthew. As Goodacre explains, Acceptance of the priority of Mark alongside Luke's knowledge of Matthew fundamentally alters the way in which we might view the growth and development of the gospel genre, or subgenre. The Ferrer theory suggests a genetic relationship among the synoptics in which each gospel's predecessor provides not only source material, but also the catalyst for writing. The priority of Mark is not universally granted, however. Though boasting a few defenders in modern times, one historically important synoptic theory is called the Augustinian hypothesis. 
This hypothesis posits that the Synoptic Gospels were written in the order in which they appear canonically in the New Testament, Matthew 1st, Mark 2nd, and Luke 3rd. One defender of this theory in recent memory is John Wenham, who explains it as follows. There seems to be a good case for believing that Matthew, possibly in a Semitic language, was the first gospel, that Mark is substantially the teaching of Peter who knew Matthew's gospel, and that Luke knew and used both Matthew and Mark. Lastly, we come to the two-gospel hypothesis, also known as the Greisbach hypothesis. This hypothesis agrees with the Augustinian hypothesis in affirming that Matthew was the first gospel to be written. It differs, however, in that it views Luke as being the second gospel and Mark as being the third gospel, rather than the other way around. In this way, Mark being the shortest gospel becomes an abbreviated combination of both Matthew and Luke with some degree of unique material added in. Because it posits that Mark is a combination of two other Gospels, it takes the name the Two Gospel Hypothesis. William Farmer explains, Taking into account the fact that Mark could not be understood simply as an epitomizer of Matthew, Greisbach proposed that Mark was written later than Luke and was dependent on both Matthew and Luke. The very extensive agreement between Matthew and Luke, then, was due to Luke's use of Matthew, and peculiar agreements between Matthew and Mark in order and content, combined with the peculiar divergences from Matthew by Mark in both order and content, was explained by holding that Mark almost never diverged from Matthew in order, and seldom in content, unless he was following the order and content of Luke. It's important to keep in mind that not all proponents of the two gospel hypothesis agree with Greisbach or Farmer that Luke depended upon the canonical gospel of Matthew. Ward Powers, for example, defends a version of the two gospel hypothesis, which views canonical Matthew and Luke as being written prior to Mark and also independently of one another. Powers argues that, the evidence indicates that neither Matthew nor Luke saw the completed gospel written by the other prior to publishing his own, and this points to the publication of both of them in the same year. Later, the gospels of Matthew and Luke had begun to circulate among the churches, and Mark used both of them as the basis of his gospel. But we shall explore these questions more in future videos. For now, suffice to say that the two-gospel hypothesis only requires one to accept that Matthew was written first, Luke was written second, and Mark was written last. It doesn't necessarily commit one to accepting that Luke knew or used Matthew. In this video, we have begun to explore the nature and scope of the synoptic problem and explained its relevance to Christian apologetics. I have endeavored to argue that there is a genuine puzzle to solve regarding the relationship of the synoptic gospels to one another. Attempts to deny this fail to explain the verbatim agreements among the synoptics. I have also briefly surveyed the major ways in which scholars have sought to understand the relationships among the synoptic gospels. Ultimately, this series will argue that the two gospel hypothesis is the best explanation of the evidence internal to the synoptics themselves, as well as the external evidence consisting primarily of the early patristic testimony bearing on the order of the gospels. But this video has simply been intended to lay the groundwork for that argument by introducing viewers to the relevant issues and the available options.